Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to the first ever NYU Undergraduate Mathematics Colloquium hosted by NYU Siam. My name is Chela Syra Haven, and I am Vice President of NYU's Chapter of Siam, a Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. Uh, this evening will be the first of a six part series called Special Relativity Through Linear Algebra with Mathematica. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mr. Ajit Gary. Ajit is a master's student in mathematics at NYU Tandon School of Engineering. Um, and he works with the Gravitational Astrophysics Laboratory at NASA Goddard. Uh, he'll be presenting on the formulation of special relativity as a problem in linear algebra uh, and some related models in Mathematica. So uh, without further ado, uh, here's Ajit Gary. Hey guys, all right, uh, so I'm flattered that you all showed up and hopefully I can catch your attention enough this time to come back for the rest. So, um, all right, uh, let me first just talk about um, what I had in mind for the seminar. Um, <laughs> so um, I wanted to just call it um, special relativity for mathematicians, um, but uh, I want to be a little more clear on the uh, the flyer. So, um, right, so along the way, I want to teach you some Mathematica um, because it's super useful for modeling things. Uh, and in particular, when we make space-time diagrams, um, I have some tools that I made that um, will help you make space-time diagrams uh, easier. And, um, and I'll link you that code. Um, so that, that'll help you to like investigate things. And then uh, as for the linear algebra component of the title, so um, right, so they told me that you guys, um, I should assume you have um, a background in linear algebra and vector calculus. Um, and so I use that to focus the seminar. So um, special relativity, there's, I mean, ultimately it's a geometric uh, thing. Um, that's that's uh, if you wanted to really go from principles, you'd start with geometry. Um, some people use complex analysis to look at it. Uh, some people like to use a group theory approach, but I'm not gonna talk about any of that. Um, oh, and also the, the most general setting to talk about it would be using differential geometry. Um, so, but we're just, just going to use linear algebra and then uh, ease into um, some vector calculus, uh, which uh, which is nice actually because it helps to focus um, the problem. So, okay, so let me show you um, the notes for this. And actually I'll put the link in the chat. Okay, so uh, the link in the chat is to the um, notes on my site. Um, it's on the page on my site that's for this seminar, uh, which is uh, under development. <laughs> so, uh, cool, here, let me share my screen. Oh, hi, Cleo, cat. Okay, so, um, da -da -da. Oh, Zoom changed how they do screen sharing. Hold on. I just want to share my screen in general. Hmm. It's fine. I'll just do it uh, by window. Okay. So uh, right. So this is um, this is my site. Um, you can also see my other projects. They're over here. Some physics -y stuff. Some math stuff. But um, right. So here I'm going to put uh, some other information and uh, some mathematical code. Uh, for now, here are the notes. Um, at least the first section. Um, the table of contents is uh, is written out. But you <laughs> you'll notice the, as soon as you get to uh, section two. is and uh, it slowly takes the PDF. So, okay, great. So uh, the idea is um, I'll uh, be trying to convince you that special relativity is just uh, education. Hey, whenever I sorry, is it the same for you guys that the uh, voice is coming uh, out. Uh, hey, Ajit, could you? Uh, yeah. yeah, maybe maybe try turning off your video. I know it's not ideal, but uh, I think the internet couldn't support sure. both yeah. the sharing and uh, the face. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, if I can. Okay, hopefully this will be better. Okay, so uh, does am I sounding clear now or? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, all right, great. So, um, right, so along the way, uh, we'll encounter space-time diagrams, at which point I'll pan over to a Mathematica notebook um, and show you how to make those. Um, so I feel like with Mathematica, it's uh, it's the best way to learn it is to have a goal. Like I want to see this, and then um, and then you just learn the tools along the way. Um, there's not a lot of foundational stuff. Like it's not like object oriented or there's no classes or anything like uh, messy like that. Um, it's pretty intuitive. Okay, so uh, right, 
So special relativity for mathematicians. Okay, so Newton's theory of, um, oh, and also uh, interrupt me at any point. Um, it's, a, it's a small enough uh, group here that uh, we can definitely like answer questions along the way. Um, okay, so Newton's um, theory of gravity, uh, he, Newton invented calculus, but if you already know calculus and then you will look at Newton's theory of gravity, um, you'll notice that there's not Sorry. actually a lot going on. Oh. Sorry to interrupt are again. Um, are, you, are you sharing your screen? I couldn't see it. Um, so you can't see my screen right now. No. Is it the same or just my Oh, okay. It works now. Oh, you got it? All right, great. Good. Sorry, right, go for it. Okay, cool. So, uh, right. So, yeah, so Newton, um, uh, in quarantine, actually, uh, <laughs> during the bubonic plague, um, he created calculus and he created physics. Um, this is just a cute quote about uh, him sharing our experience. Um, this, we've, uh, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that, that it's been, uh, you've had a lot of time to focus on your studies during quarantine and nothing else. But um, right, in that time, Newton created calculus and he also created his theory of gravitation, right? So um, he created these at the same time, but uh, if in school you learn calculus first and then you go look at gravity, um, you should, Newton's theory of gravity anyway, uh, you should find it pretty easy actually because it's just an application of vector calculus. Um, in particular, in particular, uh, Newton's uh, laws of uh, Newton's laws of motion, right? So you have three. You have the law of inertia, so that's conservation of momentum. Um, so momentum is mass times velocity. Um, so you could think of like each individual little mass unit uh, and maintains its velocity. And by velocity, we mean a vector. Okay. Um, and then you have f equals ma, which is uh, force is equal equal to mass times acceleration. And of course, acceleration is the time derivative of velocity. Uh, and then we have the action reaction law. So every force has an equal and opposite force. Okay, the last one is kind of interesting. That's something about the physical world that actually happens. Like if you push down on the table, the table pushes back on you. Um, but the first two, we can uh, kind of just think of as names for things. So in vector calculus, you have positions of things and the first derivative with respect to time will be velocities of things. And the next derivative will be acceleration. And that's just how it has to be. Those are just definitions, mathematical definitions. Um, and then Newton just kind of gave names to it. Like, let's really think about what the law of inertia says. It says an object moving in a straight line with a constant velocity will continue to do that until acted upon by an outside force. But the outside force, well, F equals MA is just like naming uh, this acceleration. It's like giving a name to like the what causes acceleration. A mathematician might say Newton's uh, first two laws of physics as an object will keep moving with a constant velocity until it until it is accelerated by something. But that's obvious, right? I mean, how I mean, how else could it possibly be? Um, that's just calculus. Okay. So um, in this sense, you can reduce Newtonian mechanics to just vector calculus. If you if you're very good at vector calculus, you're an expert in, of Newtonian mechanics. You know everything there is to know about Newtonian mechanics, and you can solve any problem. So, um, right, uh, this is, this is uh, often uh, pretty much how they introduce Newtonian mechanics, like they give you vectors and stuff, and it looks a lot like calculus. Um, but special relativity, they don't tend to introduce it like that in physics courses. Um, I did a physics minor in undergrad, and uh, the, I took a class called Modern Physics, and uh, like a third of it or so was focused on special relativity. Um, it generally doesn't get its own class. Uh, I guess it's just not enough content. Um, but the way the physicists chose to approach it was, um, they would talk about the effects of special relativity that are not Newtonian, so things that Newton would be surprised by, uh, and then create some functions to quantify those. Um, but I always thought that this was a kind of an indirect way to do things. Um, and it was, I always found it hard uh, with their method to get like a foundational understanding of what's going on. And, um, and it's very hard to like solve general problems. Uh, if you're just given a couple of tools and then you're given a weird problem, it's gonna be hard to approach it. So what I wanted to do was create a formulation of special relativity, like kind of from the ground up, like just give you a mathematical structure so that if you already know linear algebra, you should be an expert about special relativity uh, once I tell you where the parts go. Like it's reduced, it, taking the physics out of special relativity. The goal is I'm just gonna tell you what physics words correlate to what linear algebra terms and how to use this. Um, and then you should be able to solve any special relativity problem. Uh, but I had another motive for this and that's because um, the terms that physicists use for these things, um, I think they're pretty misleading a lot of the time. Uh, so this is a quote by uh, Descartes, uh, the part of the brain which has the most use in mathematics, namely the imagination, is more of a hindrance than a help in metaphysical speculations. So what I think he meant by this was that um, in mathematics, it's uh, nice to imagine things because you can create whatever structure you want. But when it comes to physics, um, we need to be careful not to like reify the mathematical models too much um, and uh, like over apply them 
to reality and starting like letting our imagination about reality get away from us. So what do I mean by this? Okay, so what are some of the main effects of special relativity? Uh, the way physicists like to put it is when things are going fast, time slows down for that object. So like an astronaut in space, their clock literally like ticks slower. They don't tell from their perspective, time is flowing normally, but when they come back down to earth, they'll be a little younger. Um, and so they call that time dilation. Uh, and there's another effect when things are going fast, space like bunches up and it's called space contraction. Um, and not like a, not like a compression kind of thing, like a car moving fast um, or accelerating, like, like uh, literally space itself shrinks the way the physicists put it anyway. Um, and physicists also like to say that simultaneity is not preserved across reference frames. So if you change reference frames, and we'll define reference frames because um, I'm uh, not assuming any, I'm not assuming you guys um, know much at all about physics. So I'll walk you through there and walk you through that. Okay, so um, where was I? Uh, right, so simultaneity, simultaneity of events is not preserved when you change reference frames. Uh, and then also they say that the universe has a speed limit. Um, but I think all four of these things are misleading. Uh, that's not actually how um, a lot of these things work mathematically. Uh, and then there's all these paradoxes that um, come up. Like you might have heard of some of them. There's one called the barn ladder paradox, one called the twin paradox. And if you're just thinking about it, the way the physicists presented, presented these effects, uh, these paradoxes are hard to uh, get your head around. But um, what I'm going to do is instead of introducing paradoxes early, like physics classes tend to do, um, they try, they kind of use them as thought experiments to go from there. Um, I'm going to introduce them in like the second half of the course, like around lecture, uh, around lesson four. Um, and because I'm hoping by that point, uh, we'll have a solid enough foundation of special relativity as an application of linear algebra that you'll be able to resolve these paradoxes super easily. Um, and then when you talk to physicists and they bring up these uh, weird thought experiments, you'll just, you'll just have, uh, you'll have the answer, okay? Um, also some of these names I want to get rid of, like a length contraction, it, um, and you'll see this later in the in the seminar. But for example, length contraction, um, I think just the name itself even is is uh, is misleading about what uh, misleading to what is actually going on. Okay, cool. So um, right. Oh, and what's all this? So uh, right. So I need to put uh, I'll I'll put this link in here. So this will be um, a special relativity mathematical package. Uh, I'm going to show you some of the tools now. Um, but by the end of the course, we'll have a bunch of tools built up. Um, and then if you want to know more about Mathematica, uh, this is a course I taught at the University of Maryland as an undergrad. It's, um, it was just like a one credit course. Uh, I called it Visualization Through Mathematica. And it's, um, a bunch of, uh, it's a bunch of lessons on how to use different tools in Mathematica for visualizing things. And um, especially for like dynamic content, like things you can grab and move around. Uh, and then this is um, something I'm working on. It's, uh, so I call it Observer, uh, the SRVR standing for Special Relativity Virtual Reality. Um, I want this to be the, uh, like the big punchline at the end of the course, um, at the end of the seminar, is uh, a virtual reality simulation um, in special relativity. So the idea is you could do it on Oculus or something if you have that, or you could just do it on uh, your computer, um, or I'll just post a YouTube video also. Um, the idea is uh, you build a run around in special relativity uh, at relativistic speeds, or run around the world at relativistic speeds and see these effects in action uh, and see some of the paradoxes. Okay, cool. Uh, any questions? It's a general overview. Okay, great, cool. All right, well, let's get into it. So, um, right, where do we want to start? Oh, uh, this is just a little, um, a little bit of philosophy about how I think about math and physics. Um, you can read that later if you're interested, but it's, it's just my uh, musings. Um, I think part of the problem with, uh, with um, trying to understand these physics things is that we take the physics way too seriously. But if we go back to the math um, and then realize that uh, all physics at the end of the day is our mathematical models that you know, happen to match reality very well, um, then we can start to demystify some things, but okay. So uh, we're going to start with affine spaces and vector spaces. So um, if you've taken linear algebra, they might not have talked about affine spaces yet, uh, but it's not too bad. Um, so you all know what a vector space is, right? You can have uh, bases and uh, those bases, you can always choose uh, the basis to be orthogonal. Um, you have vectors that can be added and scaled and stuff like that. Okay. Um, an affine space is uh, something that uh, can give you a vector space, but it's, um, it has less structure. So while a vector space has to have an origin, has to have a notion of zero, um, has to have a notion of zero, uh, you know, for adding purposes and subtracting and stuff like that, um, and so that you can scale by zero. So it has to have a zero vector. Uh, affine spaces aren't like that. Uh, affine spaces don't have um, an origin. There's no, there are no special points in an affine space. It's all just like homogeneous. And then, um, but what it does have 
is a subtraction operation between any two points. And the way that subtraction operation has to be defined is that the difference between any two points has to give you a vector. And then you should be able to place that vector into a vector space of the same dimension as the affine space. Uh, okay, that might sound a little cryptic, but we have a picture here. So um, if this guy here, this, uh, this plane on the bottom uh, that intersects the origin, so this is a vector space, like a two-dimensional vector space. An example of an affine space, uh, which is, uh, so to speak, over this vector space, here literally shown over the vector space, but that's just how they say it. Um, you have this affine space up here. This is like the plane z is equal to two or something, and it doesn't have an origin. But what it does have is um, you can take a difference between any two points, like p and q here, and you get this red vector, which we can transpose down to here. Uh, and now we have a vector space. Okay, so um, to say this differently, is if you have an affine space, you can just pick an origin arbitrarily, like pick a point that you want to be the origin. And then the difference of any other point uh, to that point uh, is a vector. And you can just kind of just think of that as like a vector space with the origin being the point you chose. Uh, any affine space, there's a whole bunch of different vector spaces you can turn it into. Um, you just have to pick an origin first. Uh, is, that, uh, is that okay for, uh, with everyone? Did I lose anybody? No? Okay, great, cool. Okay, all right, now, now let's talk in physics. Oh, uh, all good, nice, cool. So uh, let's talk in physics. So um, Newton and Einstein both depend heavily on a concept of uh, an inertial reference frame. So what's an inertial reference frame? Uh, that means it's a coordinate system that uh, is allowed to be moving, but uh, is not accelerating. So inertial as in it uh, like obeys, like it has inertia and nothing else, like no forces. Um, Okay, but what does that really mean? Okay, let's let's break this down even farther. Uh, to break this down farther, we're gonna have to go back to the principle of relativity, which is also something that Newton believed in. Uh, Galileo even believed in this. The principle of relativity says that um, you could never say the objective velocity of something. You can just say it's relative velocity. Uh, and that would be because we live in an affine space, not a vector space. So um, if you're anything like me, when you took linear algebra for the first time, you started seeing you know, the world as like you know, a coordinate system. You're like, oh, cool. Like this room, the corner that looks like an origin and then you have three dimensions and uh, there's like basis vectors. Um, but the, uh, what you should notice about our reality, right? Is that uh, it's only a vector space after you pick an origin. So just a priori, there's no, there are no special points uh, like on earth, for example, it's all, it's all the same. So we live in an, a four dimensional affine space, three dimensions of space and one of time. Um, and then you can pick an origin. Anyone can pick an origin. Any moving observer can pick an origin whenever they want uh, and a coordinate system, however they want. Uh, and then they can do physics in that coordinate system and everything works fine, okay? So we live in an affine space and you can pick, um, you can pick an origin and then all of a sudden you live in a vector space. So what mathematicians are calling a vector space here, uh, physicists are calling an inertial reference frame. Um, with one little extra detail is the inertial reference frames have, um, have a velocity to them, or at least a relative velocity to other inertial reference frames. Okay, this is already getting sticky. So let's, let's, uh, let's go back to the affine spaces, right? So we live in an affine space, and um, let's say you and me uh, both pick a different origin, and um, we pick uh, different coordinate systems. And in fact, maybe my coordinate system is moving relative to yours. My coordinate system moves through time. Uh, which is fine. You do this in vector calculus uh, sometimes, uh, like um, what do they call it? Like a, a co-moving frame. I guess that's differential geometry terms. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think you've probably seen a moving reference frame before, but if not, um, that's okay if it's a new concept. So, uh, right. So then we both picked a different origin and, uh, and different coordinate systems. And in fact, my origin and my coordinates move relative to yours throughout time. Um, so then uh, mathematicians would say, uh, we defined, we, we made different vector spaces out of this affine space. While physicists would say, uh, we are observing in different inertial reference frames. Okay, the, um, and then the only rule is that uh, you, for it to be an inertial reference frame is that you can't be uh, accelerating. Uh, okay, but we just said that velocity is totally relative. You can't say anything about objective reality, sorry, objective velocity, you can only say, whether your, uh, what your velocity is, the, the velocity of your reference frame is relative to someone else's. Um, but the thing is that acceleration is not relative. And this is why um, Newton uh, said something about momentum and it said something about F equals MA, but then didn't say anything about the next derivative. Uh, it's because that's the last one that matters. So uh, in Newtonian mechanics anyway. So um, position is relative because you can pick your own origin. 
velocity is relative because it's just relative to other inertial reference frames. Um, but acceleration is not relative. Uh, and this is actually something you, you, can, uh, you can see to, um, in your normal reality with your everyday experiences. So if you think about um, sitting in a car and you black out all the windows, um, and I assume it's a very smooth road, uh, you don't know how fast you're going relative to anything. Um, how could you? You can't see anything. Uh, but you always know if you're accelerating because you can feel it. You can feel, feel yourself being pushed back into the chair or being pushed into the door or something. So um, acceleration is something that is not relative, but velocity is, okay? Uh, all right, that was some physics mixed in there. Uh, how do we feel so far? Any questions? I got a thumbs up. Okay, good, cool. So, uh, cool, all right. Well, uh, all right, just a little motivation for special relativity. Um, so uh, Newton's physics worked really well for hundreds of years. So uh, why do we even need special relativity? Um, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, uh, physics is an observational science. So where it's based off of what we see, okay? So um, we see an observation that doesn't match our predictions and then we have to come up with a new theory. So what are the observations? Well, one is that um, things uh, do seem to slow down as they go faster. Uh, for example, there are certain high energy particles that um, should decay at a certain speed or a certain rate rather, like we know their rate of radioactive decay. Um, but when they're going very, very fast, uh, they take longer to uh, disappear. Um, and our only explanation for that is that uh, that decaying uh, like element is experiencing time slower when it's moving faster. Okay, so let me say it again. So let's say um, you have some element and you know it's rate of radioactive decay. Um, and let's say that it, you know it's supposed to decay in one second, okay? Um, but then uh, it's moving, like maybe you observe it moving in nature or maybe you accelerated it in a particle accelerator or something, but it's moving very, very fast, like close to the speed of light, um, like 0.999C or something like that. Um, and then, it, but in, ah, sorry, you observe that it takes 10 seconds to decay. 10 seconds to disappear. So you're asking what happened? How is that possible? I know the rate of radioactive decay of this particle. Well, um, what, we, uh, what we figure out if we reflect a little bit on our assumptions is that uh, we assumed that the particle is experiencing time the same way we are. Um, the only explanation then is that uh, it actually experienced time slower than we did. Um, so this is something that we've seen in the lab and in nature. When things move fast, they, they, their personal clocks tick slower. That's something that we've seen and we have to grapple with now. That's like an observation, okay? Um, another observation is that nothing seems to be able to go faster than the speed of light. Um, in particle accelerators, we can uh, get in part in um, unbounded amount of, um, uh, an arbitrary amount of kinetic energy onto a particle. It can get uh, you know, more and more high energy, but it's like actual velocity just approaches the speed of light. It doesn't seem to be able to go faster than that. Um, so it's, this isn't a statement about how much en kinetic energy it can have. Uh, it's just a weird number thing with velocity. Like velocity isn't like this linear scale. Um, as you increase kinetic energy, you bunch up towards a certain velocity for some reason. Okay, so that means that math, uh, the math of, of uh, velocity addition doesn't work how Newton thought it did. Um, and one more very important observation that we were talking about earlier actually, um, is that Maxwell's equations, which govern electricity and magnetism, uh, don't work with Newto Newton's mechanics. Um, if you change reference frames, special uh, electricity and magnetism has um, uh, inconsistent things that occur. Uh, but if you change reference frames based off of Einstein's rules, then it works, which is something we'll get to. Well, we'll, we'll touch on Maxwell's at some point. But OK, great. Now let's get into Einstein. So OK, we have about half an hour left. That's perfect. Cool. All right, so uh, finally getting to Einstein's postulates of special relativity. So um, later, I want to recast these in a mathy form, uh, like we kind of talked about with Newton. But for now, let's, let's take the physics. So Einstein said um, that the laws of physics uh, should be the same uh, in, in any inertial reference frame. So we call that relativity. Um, that's not too surprising. He's basically just saying that uh, if you and I are in different uh, reference frames in different laboratories, moving at some relative velocities to each other or on different planets or whatever, um, we should be able to calculate the same effects of physics. I mean, if that wasn't true, it'd be kind of hard to do science at all. So, um, all right, cool. So uh, physics is invariance of the reference frame. Uh, the rules are the rules are the same anyway. Um, and then he also said that uh, the speed of light in a vacuum uh, is universally agreed upon in all reference frames. Okay, that's strange. So uh, we this is something we really, really have to dig into. So um, in this, that's the last time I'm going to say speed of light, or at least that's uh, I'm going to try to uh, that be the last time I say speed of light. So um, it should it sh really should be called the speed of causality. So this is kind of an artifact of 
uh, when physics was discovered, um, the speed of light was what uh, seemed to be the upper bound. Um, but in fact, the um, it's there's something more fundamental going on, uh, and it's about uh, the nature of cause and effect itself. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through an argument. Uh, it's an inductive argument, so it's uh, it's it, it might not be a, um, a thousand percent convincing to you, um, but it's uh, a way of thinking about this um, that will hopefully make you comfortable with the whole notion of causality having a speed. So what do I even mean by this? Okay, so um, and we're gonna dig into this later, but I wanna give you like, um, just like a, a little idea first. So we'll, we'll really dig into causality in lesson two, but um, okay. So I wanna explain why I'm calling it the speed of causality and not the speed of light. Okay, so um, we now know that light is a ripple in uh, the uh, electromagnetic field. It's a wave. So um, electromagnetic field, it's in four dimensions, three space and one at a time, and it's all around us. And the wave fronts, we call those photons. Um, and the idea is that uh, you can kind of think of reality as like a simulation. If you had a simulation, um, you'd have information at every point in space, uh, and then you have to evolve that information in time. Like in every time step, you have to evolve the information. Each little cell has to communicate with the cells next to it about um, what's going on so they can update. You know, like how does a wave actually travel uh, through space, right? It has to tell its neighboring space units, uh, you know, like what's going on. Um, so we have speed of the speed of uh, the wave, but where what I want to talk about is the uh, rate at which uh, the information is communicated. So what do we mean by that? So if you have a simulation um, of like maybe like temperature in a room or something, each little cell doesn't communicate with every other cell every time step. It just talks to the ones next to it, uh, and then you can actually quantify how fast information propagates through a system, like. Um, Right, so uh, when the system is the electromagnetic field, then uh, this information is light. And then for the uh, for space time, or for you can call it the gravitational field, uh, this information is um, the uh, the uh, action of gravity. So Newton thought that gravity acted instantaneously. So if the moon disappeared right now, then all the tides would fall right now, like like instantly. Like there's zero time that it takes to get there. Um, but we now know that this, that, that isn't right. Um, we know that gravity takes time to travel. Um, and in fact, we detected gravitational waves, which uh, you might've heard about. Gravitational waves are ripples in space time, or you could also think of them as ripples in the gravitational field. Um, one way to think about uh, uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity is that the gravitational field is the same as, um, is the same as space time. Okay, uh, if you've never heard this idea of a field before in physics, uh, don't worry because to mathematicians, um, it's just a function uh, over space. It's, um, we call it a potential function um, and uh, its gradient will, at any point, will tell you um, how things are supposed to move in it. Okay, great. So, uh, right, where were we? So you have a whole bunch of fields. Quantum field theory is like a modern way to think about physics. You have a whole bunch of fields and information ripples through those fields. Uh, and there's that information is like the like the the essence of cause and effect. Like how does one event affect another one? Um, the information from it has to travel. And the point is that there are multiple things that move at the speed of causality. Light moves at the speed of causality. Gravitational waves do, and a couple other things do also. So calling it the speed of light, I mean that's a, it's you know it's an ecstasy. That's just an example of um, something that moves at the speed of causality. Okay, that was that was pretty esoteric. Um, the the physics interpretations are not something you're going to need to understand what's going on further. Um, but are there any questions about calling this the speed of causality as opposed as opposed to the speed of light? No objections. Okay, great, cool. So, um, all right. So uh, Einstein told us that um, the speed of causality is agreed upon in all reference frames. Um, this should be a less weird statement than the speed of light is agreed upon in all reference frames. So if you're like driving in a car and you throw something out of the car, uh, then the thing you throw out of the car is going to have the velocity at which you threw it plus the velocity of the car, right? Um, Einstein said that light doesn't work like this. So like if you turn your, head beam, your, your, uh, your high beams on, the photons coming out of those lights are not the speed of light plus the speed of your car, it's just the speed of light. Um, and we're gonna see later that this causes uh, a whole bunch of strange effects. But, um, right, so that seems weird, right? Like why wouldn't uh, photons um, have the same velocity addition? Well, it's because we shouldn't really think of photons as particles in the way that other things are particles or objects. You, don't, you shouldn't think of photons as like these massive 
objects. Um, in fact, they're massless. Uh, okay, let's let's throw out particles. Particles isn't even a modern way to think about uh, physics. So uh, waves are. So let's let's think about this a different way. Um, what if Einstein instead said uh, the speed of causality is agreed upon in all reference frames? Um, that's a less weird that's a less weird statement. So how fast does information travel? Um, no matter how fast you are going relative to someone else's reference frame, you have to agree on how fast like the whole system evolves. Uh, to use that analogy of the um, of the simulation again, of how fast all the cells communicate with each other. Um, and that's that hopefully sounds less weird. Okay. Did anyone weird it out? No? All right. Cool. All right. So, uh, all right, let's get into it. Let's get into space-time diagrams. So today, the idea is I'm going to show you these space-time diagrams. Uh, hopefully, if we have time, I will um, show you how to make them in Mathematica. Um, and then, uh, and then we're going to talk about um, some crazy things like uh, tachyons and stuff. Uh, just by teaching you this little, um, this simple little thing about a space-time diagram, we can actually um, dive into some uh, really cool ideas. So, um, okay, so a space-time diagram. What's going on here? This dimension is space, and this dimension is time. You usually see time on the horizontal axis, like uh, you know, like stock prices or like money versus time. Um, physicists like to put time on the vertical axis. Okay, uh, we'll get used to it. So, um, what are all these points? So these are events. So like this guy here is an event that occurs at this position in space. So like negative 0.2 or something uh, and at 1.3 seconds or whatever our time unit is, okay? Uh, an event is an idealization. Um, all events like, you know, a particle collision or um, I don't know, like snapping your fingers, all of these events uh, in the real world take a certain amount of time and exist in a certain amount of space. But we're gonna use these idealized events that just exist at little points. Um, when we get into the vector calculus, if you want, it can be a little like volume form or something. But uh, for now, we're just going to idealize them as literal points. Okay. Okay. So uh, we place these points down uh, in space time. Um, and then uh, the next natural thing to do besides events is objects. So objects move through space time. Uh, an object exists at different points in space uh, for each point in time, but they exist at all points in time. You know, they, they exist. So um, let's see what that would look like. Uh, hold on, we'll get back to that in a second. So this is what we call a world line. So um, all right, this blue line here corresponds to an object that is at rest. Okay, how can we see that? Uh, if this was space versus time, then the slope of these lines would be their velocity. Um, since it's time versus space, uh, the inverse slope is going to be the velocity. Okay, we'll get used to that. So then if an object's at rest, so it's not moving at all, that means that it has a velocity of zero. Uh, so the slope would be like this undefined vertical line. And let's, let's, let's just think about this for a second, right? So um, event B is this object just sitting here. And then some time ticks by. Remember, time is up. So time is going by. And it doesn't move in space at all. Event D is just another name we gave for it just sitting here. And event E is when something else uh, intersected it. But it just sits here for all time. Something at rest is just a vertical line on our space-time diagram, OK? Uh, well, this line corresponds to a particle or an object, some object that's moving uh, with some non-zero velocity. Uh, what's its velocity exactly? Um, it's one over whatever this slope is, uh, and it looks negative here, right? So as time goes up, excuse me, it's going backwards in space, okay? Like that. Okay, um, is anyone, uh, is everyone okay with like reading these space-time diagrams so far? Events and line, world lines, yeah? Yep, great, cool. What was that? Zoom in? Uh, ah, yes. Yeah, we'll zoom in a bit, yeah. Thank you. Great, uh, totally. OK, now, um, all right, so the speed of causality is something super fundamental, um, or the speed of light, if you want, um, something super fundamental. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend we're astrophysicists and uh, um, set it equal to 1. So what do I mean by that? I mean, we're going to pick units that make the speed of causality 1. So the speed of light is 300 million meters per second. Um, Okay, meters are just like a very small unit. Let's pick a new unit called like super meters. And um, a super meter is like 300 million meters. So in super meters per second, the speed of light is just one, okay? Um, I'm just gonna pick new units so that the speed of light is one. So the speed of causality is one, because uh, that's more convenient, okay? Um, or you could think of it as, uh, I didn't write units on this graph. Um, you could think of the space units as one super meter and uh, and this is one second. So in one second for one super meter, uh, isn't that a light second? Uh, yes, it is a light second, um, totally. Um, I, I figured if I had called it a light second uh, right off the bat, that would have um, kind of begged the question, right? Um, but yes, that's exactly the point, right? It's a light second. 
Um, so we'll have space be light seconds. Um, light years is the unit of space. It's just like light second is a unit of space. It's how far light travels in a second. Um, so it's like seconds per light seconds, uh, seconds versus light seconds. Um, so then if this scheme or in this unit system, uh, the speed of causality is of course going to have a slope of one because um, it goes one light second per second. Great, uh, cool. Now, according to Einstein, uh, nothing can go faster. Well, according to observations, really, <laughs> nothing can go faster than the speed of causality. Nothing can go faster than one, uh, than a velocity of one with, in our scheme, which means that the slope of these lines is always going to have to be bigger than this thing, uh, than this, this, this kind of line. So remember, um, bigger slope means smaller velocity just because slope here is the inverse of velocity. Okay, so one more time, uh, bigger slope is smaller velocity, right? Um, you know, like and uh, under like infinite slope or whatever is or undefined slope is in fact zero velocity. Okay, um, so the max velocity that uh, you could ever have um, is a perfect, uh, you know, this perfectly uh, forty-five degree angle slope of one. Um, any other velocity will approach this line. Okay, um, so hopefully you can imagine if you um, if you have a, a particle and then maybe you consider a different particle that's moving a little bit faster and another particle that's moving a little bit faster. And you just keep linearly like increasing the velocity. Um, well, I guess you can't linearly increase the velocity. You literally increase the kinetic energy. Like you have a rocket booster that just keeps firing. Um, the velocity will, this line here, um, will just keep tilting closer and closer to the speed of causality line. The slope will just approach one, okay? Uh, okay, so then all the lines you see here, all these world lines, unless it's a photon, it better have a slope uh, less than one at all times, or I mean, or if it's negative, then a slope greater than negative one. The absolute value of the slope has to be less than one. Okay, is everyone okay with that? Great, I will right, we'll take that as yes. <laughs> all right, cool. So, um, right, let's do some linear algebra real quick. Uh, okay, so we're gonna wanna think of space-time as a vector space. Uh, I know I just told you that space-time is an affine space. Okay, so um, the world you live in is an affine space. Um, but anyone is free to pick a, an origin in a coordinate system, or another way of saying that is anyone is free to pick an inertial reference frame. Um, and then that gives you a vector space. So the idea is you have this affine space and you have a whole bunch of observers in it and each observer picks their own uh, vector space, essentially. Uh, and all of these vector spaces represent the same space. Uh, and the game is going to be, if I see it as this vector space, I see space time as this vector space, how can I uh, do a transformation on this vector space to get what the vector space looks like to you, okay? So in your vector space, um, essentially, the one of the punchlines here is that it's going to be a choice of basis. So you chose a basis for your vector space, and I chose a basis for my vector space, and um, I just need to figure out what the linear transformation is to make my space time uh, look like your space time, uh, and that's going to be how um, how we uh, actually compare observations in my reference frame and your reference frame. The, the paradoxes, so to speak, in special relativity, they're not really paradoxes. They're just misunderstandings, of course. Um, if they're really paradoxes, then that would be a problem for the theory. Um, but the so-called paradoxes in special relativity arise from when we convert from the way I see, thing, see things to the way you see things. And then um, there's like these non-Newtonian things happening, like time slowing down and weird stuff like that. Um, but if we really understand this linear transformation that takes it from my basis to your basis, uh, then we should be able to resolve all these paradoxes. So here's the setup. Um, we're going to say space is one dimension and time is another dimension. Um, so we're going to start with one, one, so-called one, one space time. So that's one dimension of space and one dimension of time. Uh, you may notice that uh, this, these graphs are, um, these plots are one dimension of space and one of time. Eventually we'll do three of space and one of time, but those are way harder to draw, right? Uh, my idea is I'll do one, one space time like this. I'll do two one space time, so two of space and one of time um, with a 3D plot made in Mathematica. Um, and then three one space time, uh, at the end of the course, I'll show you um, in virtual reality is the idea. Uh, and then you can like see like causality spheres and stuff like erupting through space. Okay, uh, that'll be fun, but we have to build up to that. <laughs> uh, otherwise the, <laughs> the simulation won't make any sense to you. <laughs> okay, so um, great. So uh, once we pick an origin, we're going to name events uh, by vectors. Um, just by like, you know, their coordinates. Uh, and we're going to, um, we're going to insist that uh, space and time are orthogonal. Space is uh, one dimension and time is the other. Um, and they're, they're orthogonal to each other. Um, hopefully that feels intuitive to you. Um, do you feel like space and time are orthogonal? Uh, you can, you, <laughs> you, um, you can move uh, through space, uh, you can move through time and they uh, act independently. Um, <laughs> we're gonna find that they're actually uh, 
only orthogonal in in a different sense of the of the word but we're going to make that mathematically precise so don't worry um in fact that assumption there that space and time are orthogonal um it's like an anthropic bias so it's like uh it's a bias in the way we think about it um and that's and that's where a lot of the the misunderstandings of special relativity come from but okay uh, a lot of seed planting this lesson uh and a lot of this will make sense as we go on but okay so uh the the setup that we did linear algebra wise so far is just that the space time is an affine space you can pick an origin and now you're living in a vector space um or an inertial reference frame physicist uh and then the events are existing at positions in space and time um so those are vectors in our vector space you can add vectors in our vector space what does it mean to add events well you can add space like you can just put two rollers next to each other and add length um, you can also add time like okay so i'm going to add five minutes to my timer right so it's um you can add time and you can add space uh that's how we do geometry in the real world um that's how we keep time in the real world so um maybe it's not so crazy to think of uh space time as a vector space and events as vectors um is everyone okay with that space time is a vector space events are vectors uh one dimension of space one is time yep okay. great cool thanks for the feedback um all right so um, interpreting a space-time diagram with causality lines. This is going to be the last setup we need before we get to start seeing some cool effects, um, which we have like 15 minutes for. Fantastic. Okay, so um, right. So horizontal lines and vertical lines uh, aren't nearly as useful in space-time diagrams as they are in like Newtonian mechanics. Um, I think what's really important, uh, really important, are following uh, following the flow of causality, or like following. You know, if you want to follow a photon, you're always following it along a diagonal line with slope one. Photons can only move along diagonal lines with slope one. So what I did here is I put um, a grid of diagonal lines on the background. So it's like rotated graph paper. So instead of graph paper, we're going to use a what a, I just called a causality grid. Um, this is going to make it easy to see how information travels. So like, for example, let's say event A is a, a star, um, a star being born, right? So um, when a new star is like born, um, after the light has had time to get to Earth, you'll see a new star appear in the sky. So uh, my question is, um, so let this world line represent uh, an observer on Earth and A here represent a star being born. The question is, when will the observer on Earth see that star being born? Okay. Um, you don't go horizontally that I mean information can't travel that fast um, that would be infinitely fast that's not good that, that would be like what Newton did. Uh, we know now the information and photons and light and causality okay uh, so light in particular in this example um, travels uh, at the speed uh, negative one in these units okay so uh, to the left here, so we follow this line and then it intersects the world line right here. So which means this event here is when uh, our observer on earth will. Um, see the star being born okay um in general if you look at this uh if you look at this crisscross on a so uh back before so here like this crisscross on crisscross on a physicists call that the light cone and we'll be calling it the causality cone that's the wave of influence um from that event so an event happens and then light propagates light and gravitational waves and just information in general propagates out from it uh in this like you know to the right at the speed of light and to the left of the speed of light or the speed of causality more generally. Um, and that means that anything that this could be a, like, so if you have cause and effect relationships, if this is the cause, any effect that comes from it has to be inside this cone. Um, anything out here is something that the information just literally hasn't had time to get to yet. Okay, um, it's impossible for event A to affect something over here because um, literally like that information would have had to have gone faster than the speed of causality. Uh, and conversely, the only things that could have led up to A, the only information that could have fed into A happening, is so if A is the birth of a star, the only mass that could have gone into that star being made um, is in like the reverse causality cone. Um, anything over here uh, just literally like didn't didn't get there in time. Is not gonna is not going to be able to get to uh, our you know proto star before it uh, before it catches on fire, right? So then uh, this is so cause and effect. Uh, cause and effect is um, is the game. Uh, in special relativity, um, if you want, uh, you know, like uh, some some might argue that cause and effect is like inextricably tied to free will. Like, how can you be free if um, if you if you, there isn't this notion of causality whereby you can affect reality? What does it mean to be free? You know, you can affect things. Okay, um, we we travel through time forwards and we judge time by cause and effect relationships. Um, you don't have to completely believe that argument. That's philosophy. That's not math. Right, that's just a little motivation for why cause and effect is so important. Okay, 
Um, so we're going to call this ca the causality cone. Stuff back here can affect A, and then A can affect stuff inside of here. Uh, did, did we lose anybody on that? Are you OK? All right, great, cool. So now here, it's just like a whole bunch of causality cones everywhere for us. Oh, sorry, I know it's an X. Um, we call it, physicists just call it a cone because in two dimension, two one space time, it looks like a cone. In three one space time, it would look like this emerging sphere. Um, but anyway, so uh, right, okay. So now we have causality cones for everything. Um, so here, the so the observer along this world line would see the star born at A. Uh, and if you want to know what the last thing the star sees from Earth. Uh, before it, you know, is born, or the, the protostar sees from Earth before it's born, you know, all this mass, uh, you can travel its, uh, you can follow its uh, causality line backwards to hit, uh, to hit the planet. So this is the observer on Earth. Uh, B is the last thing the star sees before, or the protostar sees before it bursts into a star. Um, and then here's the light coming from that new star, and bam, that's when our observer on Earth uh, sees it happen. Okay, so is everyone comfortable with reading this diagram? Because uh, if you're not, it's going to make it harder to interpret what's going on next. Okay, cool, um, cool. Yeah, I, I have a question. Great. Um, I, yeah, I was wondering whether this causality effect is able to explain why we cannot travel backwards in time. Yes, yes. Or is this something uh, related? Right, right. So, um, that's, that's the idea, right? Is that causality is a way of orienting time. So space is symmetric left and right, up and down, forwards, backwards, it doesn't matter. Um, time though, it yeah. feels like there is uh, an orientation to it. it, like it hurls forward. Um, but maybe it's just us that are hurling forward. We go forward. Um, me existing at this point in time can be considered a cause for me existing uh, at, at one second in the future. Like, uh, like your world line is just like a locus of cause and effect relationships. Um, so actually, that's a great, great question, because uh, after this Doppler shift uh, section, the next example actually is we're going to talk about what something moving faster than the speed of causality would even look like. Um, and since you ask, the punchline is that since we are moving forward in time and, you know, we experience cause and effect in this direction through time, um, everything we perceive is also going to be uh, um, having a cause effect relationship forward in time. And that's just a symptom of us moving this direction uh, through space time. And there's lots of physics that deals with the idea of what if something could go faster um, than the speed of causality. Uh, but the thing is that we'll never actually be able to see it going faster than the speed of causality. And we're gonna make that concrete in the diagram. So great question and it's a great segue. So, um, uh, Thanks. and actually since, yeah, and actually since we're uh, getting um, close to the end of the seminar, um, I'm happy to stick around if anyone still wants to, uh, um, round off like the other stuff I put in this lesson, but I have like seven sections of just like examples. So getting through all of it is unrealistic anyway, but um, okay. So the Doppler, uh, so this is a, this, uh, this is the optical Doppler effect. So it's just like the, um, the sound Doppler effect, um, but for light. Um, okay, so you can, you can read this explanation. Uh, let me jump to this because uh, he's asked about it. So the feynman Stuckelberg interpretation of tachyon. So what's a tachyon? A tachyon by definition is something that moves faster than the speed of light, faster than the speed of causality, okay? So this would be a tachyon. It's something that moves faster than uh, it moves faster than um, uh, any of our uh, point uh, lines in our causality grid. And let me switch over to a different um, a different share. I um, I seem to have uh, uh, underestimated how long it takes to teach people physics. Um, so <laughs> uh, I, um, unfortunately, I won't be able to give you any crash course in Mathematica uh, today. But next lesson. We definitely can. So, um, okay. So on this diagram, let me take this guy out. Oops. Make this a little simpler. Okay. So um, here I have a little, um, in Mathematica, that's called a locator. It's super convenient. You can move things around. Uh, and I attached a backward causality cone to it. Okay. So you can move this around and uh, you can see. Um, so what, what do these lines do for us? If you follow these lines back, um, that tells us what information is just now getting to P, okay? So event P, or so observe, uh, P is like an observer, right? I can follow, I can drag P along this line that I labeled observer. And what P does for us with these backwards causality lines, it tells us what information is just now getting to you. So like, if I want to observe this normal particle moving at a, you know, a less than light speed, I track back along this causality line and I see, oh, this is the light, the piece of light from this particle that is just now getting to my eyes. So this particle is doing its own thing, and it's constantly releasing light rays along this, uh, along these causality lines. 
And if we follow those causality lines up, um, that's when the light is just getting to us. That's when the information is just getting to us. You know, you don't see an object exactly where it is right now. You see where it was, um, you know, uh, a little bit in the past, however long it took the light to get to you. So if I want to see if we want to see what the observe, how the observer sees this normal particle, what we do is we just follow, we uh, drag this locator up and we see, okay, so on the left there, uh, we see the light coming from the left. Here they actually intersect. And as we go on, we see um, the particles light getting to us on an ever increasing like lag. Uh, and that's just because it's getting farther away. Okay, is everyone okay with that? This is just how you see particles, how you see things. Good. Uh, now let's see what looking at a tachyon would mean. So this guy, uh, it moves faster than the speed of causality. Let's see what it would actually look like. So here, these backwards causality lines don't intersect at all. We don't see it yet. It doesn't exist. Uh, and then all of a sudden, bam, something exists. Okay, it popped into existence. And then we see both directions of this causality line hit, uh, these causality lines hit the tachyon's world line, which means this observer would see one copy of the tachyon over here and another copy of it over here. And as, you, and as time goes on, you'll see one copy of it flying off to the right, aging forward, if tachyons could age, aging forward. Um, and then another copy of it flying backwards, aging backwards. So like if the tachyon is like a person moving at, like say a person is moving faster than the light and here they're you know, uh, here they're, uh, you know, a certain age, and then they get a little bit older as you go down this direction. Um, the observer is going to see that person flying away from them, aging this direction, and flying away from them in the other direction, also aging backwards. That's so strange. That's so strange. Do you understand? Um, do you understand? Uh, or sorry, I, I should ask the negative. So um, did I lose anybody on why you would see two copies of this? Yeah. <laughs> I lost Can you. you? Just go okay. that so, again? Um, Totally. So, um, right. How do you see things? You see things because the photons come off of it and then um, they hit your eyes. Um, that takes time uh, for the photons to get to you. So, um, so right here, uh, um, this is the stationary observer. You can say that's you. And this normal particle, it's like a very fast baseball flying through the air. Um, so here it is at this point, and then you can follow the causality lines to see the light from each moment of the baseball's life uh, hitting your eye. So light comes off of it and you see it here. Uh, if you want to ask at this moment in time what the observer sees, you don't go horizontally like Newton thought. You don't go horizontally and say, oh, you would see the particle right here. No, you go down this direction. You see the particle here because it took some time to actually get to you. Did that make sense? Yeah, I think okay. so. Hopefully like, that like a real baseball would so? be almost, okay. almost a vertical line, right? Because it's not going as yes, exactly. approximate. Right, right. OK, sure. Right. So th th this is why I put the, the Doppler shift thing first, but then I, you know, I misjudged my timing here. Um, right. So for normal things, they move so slow that where you see them is basically where they are. They haven't moved much in the time it took the light to get to you. Um, but the, uh, and that's actually just because they're not very far away from you. But, um, all right, but if you threw a baseball at somebody at 0.9 the speed of light, it'd be really weird to watch um, because uh, let's say you threw it at some, threw a baseball at you at half the speed of light. Well, when the baseball is at a certain, you see it at a certain position, where you see it? Well, in the time it took the light from that position to get to you, the baseball's traveled half the distance between you in that time. The baseball would appear to come at you like way faster than it actually is. The light would like bunch up. The light would do a Doppler, a Doppler shift towards you. Um, and in fact, it would be uh, uh, blue shifted. Um, and then as it's flying away from you, uh, it would, um, it'd be like on this like ever increasing lag. Uh, it's like running, it's like running away. Like every time you see it, it's already run away a significant distance from, from where it was when you saw it. Um, so here, this is like a very fast thing that you're observing. And, um, and it's just always on this lag. And as it gets farther away, the lag increases. So you're always seeing it in the past and you're, or you're always seeing it in the past. And in fact, um, you're gonna see, like if this thing is aging along this line, you're gonna see it, um, you, well, I, I don't wanna talk about how it's experiencing time yet because that's not trivial. <laughs> so um, we'll leave it at that for now. Okay, uh, so the tachyon, I wanna see how you would see the tachyon. Well, when we follow back these light rays, so here, we follow back light rays and we follow back the causality lines and it doesn't hit it at all. Then here, it pops into existence for one instant in time. 
And then if you go any, anywhere forward, if we just trace back these causality lines, we're going to see that one copy of it is here and one copy of it is here. So um, to our student that asked uh, about what about fast, like, uh, is this why things can't go faster than causality, uh, faster than light because it would break causality? Well, this is what happens when you move faster than the speed of light or faster than causality is us who are humbly moving through space at a, or moving through time forwards, as opposed to this tachyon that's essentially moving through time backwards here. Um, and actually I didn't even have to make the time, sorry, I didn't have to make the tachyon moving through time backwards. It could have just been a, um, here, I'll change, uh, make this just a slant of 1.75 there. And we'll see the same thing happen actually. So um, this tachyon is moving faster than causality. Uh, what happens is um, at one, when it intersects us, it just spawns into existence but then we see one half of it, or not one half, it's two copies of it. It's literally two copies of it. We see, it's, um, we see an old version of it and a young version of it all the time. Um, and okay, so if you think that's weird, it's about to get way weirder. So you may have heard um, just, you know, as like a, like a pop science thing. Um, so what else does this? Uh, it just pops into existence. There's two of them and uh, they have like the same mass, but some other properties are opposites. Does that, does that ring a bell to anyone, especially maybe our physics student? Antimatter. Antimatter. Yes, exactly. So let's go. Let's go back to. Um, let's go back to our PDF. So this is so strange, uh, and I'm I'm really surprised actually that I never heard of it uh, in like a pop science thing before I heard about it in um, in uh, actual physics. So uh, hold on, where did my PDF go? Um, the, to make that it's preview. So um, new share, and I want to preview. Okay, good. So um, great. So you, should be, so you should be able to see that now. Okay. So the uh, Feynman Stuckelberg interpretation of tachyons is that tachyons are indistinguishable from matter antimatter pairs. So, um, okay. So for our student that took electricity and magnetism, especially, you know that in a charged particle moving through an, uh, a magnetic field will create a current. Well, if that particle was moving backwards through the field um, or was just aging backwards, um, then it would be create a current in the opposite direction. Um, and this is exactly what we see with matter and antimatter is they have opposite charge, like electrons and positrons have opposite charge. Okay, so if you're not a physics uh, person, then um, you don't need to know that part. Um, but here's the punchline is that mathematically speaking, Matter antimatter pairs are indistinguishable from particles that are moving faster than light, faster than causality. If something is moving faster than causality, what you would witness is either um, an, a, a version of it flying forwards through time and a version of it flying backwards through time up here at the same time. We call this matter antimatter pair production, or you would see those two um, copies of it annihilate each other. Like, didn't that always seem weird to hear about matter antimatter annihilation? Like, what do you mean the two, the two, like, first of all, why does every particle have to have an opposite version? That sounds, that sounds kind of like mythological. Why does it have to have an opposite version, an anti-particle, like a dark version? Like, um, and then they hit each other and they just disappear. And then also sometimes they just, pop into existence and they get away with cheating the whole conservation of energy thing because they're opposites in some sense. Like one of them has negative energy or something. Like, like physicists tried to sell us on this, but it's, when you think about it, that I think anyway, that that sounds like a more rid ridiculous explanation than just thinking about it as moving faster than causality. And in fact, Feynman proved that, or Feynman and Stuckelberg showed that this, these definitions are completely equivalent. Mathematically, it's the same, and it's just philosophy at that point, whether you want to call it anti-particle, anti-particle particle pairs, or you want to call it a tachyon. So um, you may have seen a Feynman diagram before, where Feynman routinely draws um, arrows here. This arrow, so this is space and this is time, just like our diagrams. This electron is moving forwards in time, and this positron is moving backwards in time. Like Feynman draws these diagrams routinely with things going backwards in time, because that's just okay. <laughs> it's just okay in this theory. Um, here, so here's an example. Um, so uh, another way of describing this is what if you have an electron that's flying through space time, right? Just like us going at a normal less than light velocity. Um, and then it turns around, not in space, but in time, okay? Um, it turns around in time. We can't turn around in time. You can't go backwards in time, right? I, I, and I think that's just a, uh, you know, a, psych, a, a psychological like aspect of free will. Like what, like, could you even be like a, 
conscious creature, if you could just go backwards in time and undo your own thoughts, that sounds weird. That sounds like hard to match up with the whole being human thing. Um, but an electron doesn't care. Um, what if, right? What if an electron could just go back, go backwards? Like it's going forwards in time and then it decides, nah, okay, I'm gonna go backwards in time. You know, I live in a four dimensional vector space. I can go any direction I want in space. So why can't I go either direction in time too? So then here, this electron is going forwards in time, doing something normal. And then it decides to turn around and go backwards in time. Same, same uh, motion through space, but it's going backwards in time now, okay? Well, what would this actually look like? If you take this little uh, locator and you slide it up, you'll see um, an electron at any, any point of this, you'd see an electron going forward and an electron uh, aging backwards, um, which correlates because of electricity and magnetism to the opposite charge. Um, fly towards each other and then disappear. So when you look at it like this, which one really seems more ridiculous? That electrons can turn around and go backwards in time or that matter and antimatter, like these things are always, um, these things always exist in pairs and they're like opposites. And then they're always on a collision course, which also seems weird. Like why do they have to be on a collision course? And then they just pop out of existence, right? Like. I think personally, I like the philosophical interpretation better of that the electrons are moving backwards in time. Sometimes electrons just turn around in time. Um, how do we feel? Like extremely confused, but in a good way. <laughs> extremely confused in a good way. Awesome, great. Um, in fact, quantum field theory, um, and this isn't about quantum field theory, and I'm not an expert at all in quantum field theory. Um, I, I'm just trying to talk about special relativity, but um, this is worth mentioning. Um, in quantum field, field theory, um, like, you know, in modern science, it's um, totally reasonable to talk about things moving um, faster than the speed of causality. Just the thing is, since we are moving forwards in time um, at less than the speed of causality, everything we perceive looks like cause and effect. Everything we see looks like it's going forward in time. That's why when we first saw antimatter and matter, it looked to us like two opposite type of particles running into each other and, um, and annihilating each other or just popping into existence, flying off in opposite directions. That's what it looked like to us because we're going forward through time. Um, but that doesn't mean it was. Um, it just means that our perception <laughs> is bounded by this, this forwards cause and effect thing. But that doesn't necessarily mean that everything is bounded by this. Okay. Um, and in fact, there's this one really weird theory um, called the, uh, and, and this has been a reasonable um, interpretation theory, but I think maybe. Right, of mass, which is up to us. This one. Hello, Adi. Your ignite is uh, giving up. This is it's not just me, right? What was that? Yeah. That's not my answer. Yeah, your internet is giving up. Sorry. Uh, Hello? So uh, I'm just gonna go out on the balcony for connection purposes. Yeah, oh, sorry, thanks. Yeah, much better. Much better. Do you mind if I just sit in here? I mean, not be in your way. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, right. So there's this interpretation called the one electron universe. Yeah, is there's just one the whole universe of light or less than the speed of causality, like we do. It can any it can go any speed speed through time. All over the place. It's like you can like and just draw squiggly lines on this and do whatever it wants. Um, but even more concretely, you could just think it goes straight lines until it's interacting with something else. Like
Oh, we lose them? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, usually they come back in you know, a few seconds or so. How's everybody doing? Is everybody in, in New York? Is all the time zone right? Mm, no, but the time zone isn't that bad. Okay. I was in the West Coast like just last week and it's three, even three hours are not easy. Anybody else? Everybody else in New York? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, why don't we wait for uh, Ajit to get back? Um, I think we're going to go ahead and make a quick announcement. Uh, Ethan, our webmaster and our uh, fellow SIAM uh, executive board member, uh, has something he'd like to share with you? Uh, yeah, so um, if you guys would like to be notified about future events or uh, join our club, um, please visit the link in the Zoom chat um, and fill out the Google form. Uh, please note at the end of the Google form, there's uh, instructions for how to register for the parent SIM uh, organization. If you register for them, they give you free access to journals, um, activity groups, as well as like discounts to various books, conferences, and et cetera. Um, yeah, so visit our club's website to uh, to view our events and join the club. Uh, the link for the website is also in the chat. Um, so anyways, uh, I think, uh, did he just rejoin? Yeah, okay, uh, I'll go back to him. I am back. <laughs> Great, ah, my audience is still here, fantastic. Okay, so the punchline, right? <laughs> the last thing I wanted to teach you today anyway, right at the end, okay. Um, what if you just have one electron and it's going squiggly lines through space and time, uh, forwards and backwards in time all over the place. Um, and every time it changes directions from forwards to backwards, that looks like to us, so it's going forwards in time and then all of a sudden it, it, you know, it turns around and starts going backwards. That looks to us who have to go through time forwards as a particle and an antiparticle running into each other and annihilating. And every time it's going backwards in time and turns around to going forwards, that looks like to us who are just humbly going forwards in time um, as a matter antimatter pair production, um, like an electron and a positron just pop into existence at the, like at the same point, flying opposite directions with opposite charge. Um, and one more step is this world line, this crazy like curvy world line that's following can self intersect. And every time it self intersects, that's what we perceive as two electrons or two positrons hitting each other. But what if it's just the same electron going back in time and hitting itself? And the positrons are also just the electrons going backwards through time. Mathematically, that's exactly what's happening. Um, and it's up to your interpretation whether you want to believe that it's one electron in the whole universe or a bunch of them. And sometimes positrons just appear. I know the one electron universe also sounds crazy, but I think I personally think it kind of sounds less crazy than, than all particles have these like, you know, mythical uh, anti versions that, uh, that pop into existence all the time. Okay, all right, uh, how, do we, how do we feel? Uh, something that like, uh, I thought it might be like interesting is that I, I read a book by uh, Carlo Rovelli here, and he describes time uh, as basically the way that time flows for us is this the behavior, our behavior entropically, our entropy works in a certain direction and it basically defines everything and the concept of time doesn't really exist. So the way like, can you like analyze the electron and positron going forwards and back? It's just one of them behaves the way our entropy is supposed to behave and the other one does the exact opposite. So, because yeah. I, I think that's how I visualize it. Uh, because if you, I think in time, right. if you think in time terms, it makes no sense to see something going back in time. So the way yeah. I see it is just behaving opposite in entropy. Sure, that's such a cool idea. The, um, so the way entropy works is you have, um, entropy is talking about uh, the most probabilistic state of macro state of a system. So systems can look certain ways macroscopically and there's lots of different micro states that can form that. Um, so like uh, the air in a room, 
um, there are or actually let's just use coins. So if you flip 100 coins, um, there's lots of ways you can get 50 heads and 50 tails. There's lots of different orders that will make that happen. Um, but there's only one way that you're going to get 100 heads, and that's if you get head, 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 head. But you could, but to get 50 heads and 50 tails, you could go heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, or you could do like, there's you know there's tons of different ways to do it. Um, so that's why that's I mean that's what the um the uh what what do they call it in math? They call it the um central limit theorem or the law of large numbers. It's just like that the system will converge towards um, a certain state. It's converging towards a macro state, just like probabilistically, because there's more micro states that correspond to that macro state. Like the macro, I, I think, I think that, I think that um, idea in math is actually like cheating. It's like, it's like um, some of those macro states actually correspond to more like permutations of my, you know, more micro states than the other ones. So of course they're more likely um, and they tend towards that. That's kind of the idea of entropy is we tend towards these more likely macro states. But the thing is for that to happen, you need micro states. You need a bunch of little moving parts and then you need some big human uh, thinky ob a conscious object to group them together in a certain way. Like, oh, these are 50 heads and 50 tails. Like the coins don't care. Um, you need something big to, to draw circles around these, uh, these collections of micro states. Um, but particles don't, uh, don't work the same way because a single electron, it doesn't age, it doesn't think, it doesn't have feelings, it doesn't live or die or breathe or have a clock on it. It's just one electron. It can't have a notion of time. How could he keep time? It like any clock that you could ever devise takes at least two particles. Um, you, one, one particle doesn't experience time. One particle doesn't uh, undergo this like entropic kind of evolution. So while humans, um, we do are we are um, bound to go forwards in time because of entropy, um, because of the way our our very complicated tons of particle system evolves. A single electron uh, wouldn't be bound by that same kind of thing. A single electron can do whatever it wants. Uh, it, it would be the counter argument to uh, to um, the entropy kind of interpretation. Cool. Um, well, uh, you guys are still here. Um, I'm not sure uh, if you have something else to do later. Um, I could start showing you um, how to use Mathematica. Would you be interested in that? Um, Ajit, I'll jump in first to a quick announcement um, before you go ahead and do that. Um, okay, so our next meeting for this session will be on Thursday, uh, February 25th. Um, and uh, you can join it with the same uh, Zoom link. Um, and you're welcome to stick around for any other questions. Uh, and Ajit can continue his uh, Awesome. Ah, thanks for um, thanks for that uh, uh, plug for my next meeting. Hope you guys uh, show up. That'd be great. Um, okay, cool. Well, then, uh, to ten of you uh, or eight of you still here, um, let's let's start teaching you some Mathematica. Um, Mathematica is is awesome. Just like totally fantastic. Um, it's uh, it's a coding language sort of, but uh, I don't really think of it as a coding language. I, I just kind of think of it as like. Um, this sandbox for making things uh, that you can see really easily. Um, so the idea of Mathematica is um, it has a whole bunch of functions built into it that are, oh, no, no screen share again. Um, hold on, let me try this again. You know, I had two Mathematica windows open. That might've been the issue. Okay, can you see it now? Yeah, cool, good. All right, so um, right, so in Mathematica, uh, there are a whole bunch of um, very mathy functions just built into it, um, like even better than like the Python packages. Um, and also, there's lots of visualization tools that are just very easy to create. So if you want to do, uh, da -da. yeah, it's good to see you, Pedro, and you can email me questions if uh, if you have any, of course. Um, okay, so uh, right, yeah, so um, let's start making things. Uh, what if I just want to make a plot? Um, the controls are very intuitive. I'll make a plot of x from x uh, equal um, x from negative five to five. So here's just a linear plot. Here, I'll make it x squared. Plot, easy. Um, and then the, uh, so the documentation of Mathematica is very good. So you can look up um, all these options that I'm gonna be adding. Um, aspect ratio is exactly what you would think it would do. Um, but also you can check out my notes, uh, like I said earlier, um, the visualization through Mathematica course. Uh, it's on my website, actually. One of the other boxes is, uh, is the Mathematica course. Um, Right, okay. So, uh, right, so all these uh, features you can add here are just um, optional, but they help you uh, make prettier graphs. And Mathematica doesn't really have like this like fundamental like system that you need to learn. If you want to like um, learn Java, for example, very well, you better learn how object oriented programming works. Like if you don't, then you're definitely gonna run into issues, right? Um, like 
in Python, you can kind of get away with it. You can just like do things. Um, but like maybe like C, you're going to need to uh, learn how to use pointers. Otherwise, you're going to run into issues. Um, but Mathematica, uh, all right, cool. Thanks for coming. Um, but, all right, uh, sorry, the person in the chat. OK, uh, right. So the um, Mathematica, uh, you can just go for it. Um, you're not really going to run into any issues. Uh, it just if you need a new function, you need a new feature, just look it up. And they all work together very well. Nothing's typed. Um, I could have set aspect ratio to like, uh, like a word. Um, and it, it, it wouldn't even freak out. Like it's very hard to actually get an error in Mathematica. Um, like uh, usually errors in Mathematica are dividing by zero and, and messing up your brackets. Um, the, it's, it's not, uh, it's not uh, picky about things. Okay, so um, right. So here's a plot um, and that was really quick to make, uh, but the, uh, I think the real, uh, the real thing that separates Mathematica from like um, maybe MATLAB, for example, as uh, being like the king for visualizing things is something called the manipulate function. The manipulate function, you can put around anything else and you can specify what variable you want to manipulate and it'll give you a slider uh, or other kinds of things like buttons or drop down menus or whatever um, to control that variable. So I put A here, A just for any coefficient on X squared. Um, as uh, you know, you're all good at calculus. The, if this coefficient is higher, then it's going to be a tighter parabola. If it's lower, it's going to be like a wider parabola. And I'm going to let A vary from negative two to two. And just like that, I have a plot and a slider for A. And as I slide A, it'll in real time update this plot. So like, um, I wish, uh, you know, they had had this tool when I took algebra two in like, you know, middle school or whatever. Um, it would have made visualizing polynomials a lot easier if the uh, teacher could just say, hey, look, uh, these are all of the quadratic po polynomials. So, um, so we're gonna add slide. So we're gonna, uh, we have a quadratic term, a linear term and a constant term. And we're gonna make a slider for each. Uh, and you can also add an initial value. So I'm gonna have the A slider start at one, the linear term start at zero. Uh, and the constant terms start at, I don't know, um, negative one, why not? Cool, and then I can expand out all these sliders so you can see them. Uh, and then you can slide and see all different polynomials. Um, how did I get that right arrow character? Ah, yes, so um, yeah, uh, the escape button. So you hit, um, let, me, let me show you some stuff. Uh, if you hit escape, it does this, these little three bars. Um, and then you can like type down like an arrow like this and then hit escape again, and then it makes an arrow. Um, and that arrow uh, is sometimes just an arrow if you're just typing things, but it, can al it also means like how you do this options thing. Um, oh, right, sorry, I, I, I forgot some of you are following along because, uh, right, um, Siam was uh, nice enough to uh, organize you guys getting uh, the Mathematica license uh, downloaded. So that's great. So if you're following along, um, everything you can type just as you see it here. Uh, except for that arrow, right? So um, I think also if you just type hyphen and then greater than and then hit space, it'll turn into an arrow also. But yeah, so, um, but escape uh, hyphen arrow. Um, there's lots of things you can do with escape. Like if you type escape and then you type SCA or any letter, it'll like make a script version of it. Um, if you wanna make the symbol for like the real numbers, it's like, um, what is it? DS for double struck and then R and make the double struck R. Um, but these are things um, I wouldn't study this. Like I wouldn't like, you know, just like comb through the Mathematica documentation unless you want to. Um, I would just like kind of figure out as you need it. Um, or also like skimming over my notes from that Mathematica class um, will give you an idea of like what it can do, right? Um, okay, so right. So uh, you're, a, you're um, a middle school math teacher and you're teaching them quadratic functions. The coefficient on the quadratic term um, will, uh, uh, choose the tightness of the parabola, the coefficient or the constant term, right? Like the coefficient on the one term or whatever, the x to the zero term, if you want, um, slides it up and down, it's like a y-intercept. Um, but what's way harder to imagine is what this b term does. Um, but now we can actually see. So what does this b term do? Uh, it kind of moves the whole thing along what kind of looks to be like some upside down parabola or something. It's really strange, but, um, but here it's uh, much easier to see. Okay. Uh, Great, so that's, um, that's some of the cool stuff that Mathematica uh, can do. This manipulate function is gonna be super useful to us. Um, there are other ways to get interactive things. Um, you don't have to use a manipulate. Uh, you can use um, something just called um, dynamic. So these are some functions I made. Uh, the idea is you create a dynamic module. Um, looking up the, the documentation for a dynamic module is, is a huge headache. I, I, if you wanna use dynamic modules and dynamic instead of just using manipulate, um, I would definitely recommend checking out my notes on it because um, 
because I just tell you what you need to know about it because um, it's 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 complicated and also Mathematica doesn't want you to think too hard about it. They want to make it easy for you. Um, ah, great. Uh, thanks for coming. Great. Okay, so um, right. So the dynamic module, you pick the variables that um, that you're going to um, manipulate over. Uh, I'll post this code on uh, on the website also uh, this afternoon. Um, sorry, afternoon tonight. I will. <laughs> um, okay. And then uh, any variable that you want to dynamically update, you put dynamic around. So what does that mean? Uh, that means that anytime that variable changes in real time, it will change in the code. Uh, I think I have to explain something else for that to make sense to you. Um, in Mathematica, you can type things. So you can type two plus seven, and then you hit shift enter. Uh, and then it has an input cell here. That was where you're typing and an output cell with the answer. How about three squared, nine? Or what about sine of, well, hyperbolic signs for fun of 11. Oh, you can do this to give a numerical value. Um, great, and it just gives you an output cell. Um, this output value here uh, is like static. It's like text. It just like it just spat it out. Um, but if I were to put dynamic around it, then uh, it will update every time I change something. So let me show you what I mean by that. I set x equal to two. Uh, it just says two, and then I type x. I evaluate x, and x is two because we saved it as two earlier. Um, but uh, now, um, what if I, you know, let's do, um, uh, right, okay. What if I uh, set x equal to three? Here, it still says two. It didn't like retroactively change everything. It's like a log that just like stays put. Um, but, oh, <laughs> cat. <laughs> uh, okay, the, um, right, let's type dynamic x. Uh, and then let's give a slider for x. Uh, I know I'm not explaining super well what I'm doing here, but that's because there's not much more to it. So there's not like, I'm not appealing to some fun, like fundamental like mechanics of Mathematica. It's pretty much just what you see. Um, so, uh, right, so here's a slider for it. And as I move this slider, now, since I put this in a dynamic, this will retroactively go update. But if you don't do that, then um, it'll just stay static like that. Um, you don't really want to use this too often though, because you don't want Mathematica to have all these moving parts. Like notebooks can get long. You call this, this document a notebook. Um, notebooks can get long, uh, .nb for notebook, right? Uh, these notebooks can get long. And if uh, there's a whole bunch of things that are dependent on each other, cell to cell, then it's going to slow you down. Uh, you know, if you move a slider and like 20 things in your document have to adjust themselves. So that's why the manipulate function is nice. The, manip the manip sorry, the manipulate function under the hood is written with a dynamic module. Um, well, I, I guess I don't know that for sure. It's a proprietary language that shows the source code. Um, but in my understanding is it's written with a dynamic module. Um, so within a manipulate block, uh, it's like self-contained. So that's like a, a check on um, making sure that uh, your dynamic content doesn't get out of hand. Uh, if you just started using Mathematica, it might um, give you a message asking, um, would you like to enable dynamic content? Uh, and the answer is yes, so that you can actually have dynamic stuff happening. Um, but the reason it asks you that is because if you're like, very careless. Uh, I, I don't want to say if um, it's not it's not easy to to um, to it's not like there's just like pothole or you know pitfalls everywhere uh, with using dynamic. But if you're um, if you're very reckless about it, then your, your computer is going to slow down and and uh, Mathematica will crash. Um, so that's why it asks you if you want to enable dynamic content instead of just like taking up all your RAM right away um, without asking. So uh, okay, so I really like manipulate uh, like this, um, but you can manipulate. Um, you can manipulate tons of things. Let me just give you like a weird example. Um, okay, so graphics uh, allows you to draw things that aren't plots. So you, graphics, you just give a list of things and it draws them. So let's do a line uh, from the way the line uh, thing works. And you can look up the documentation if you're interested. Um, it, you just give it a list of points and then it'll draw the line between them. So here's a line. Notice there's no axes because it's not a plot. It's just like a box, like a graphic box. Um, let's do another point. Two, four. Um, okay, I know I just said it's graphics thing, not a plot, but it does take the plot range option just because. Um, so here's a five by five plot, okay, with no axes. Um, okay, so here, here's a whole, uh, here's a whole bunch of points for it to go to, and it just travels along and draws a line. Okay, um, I can draw. Uh, there's a bunch of high level things that you can feed into as these are called graphics objects. The graphics objects are high level, right? You don't have to like code a line; it just exists. You can just also just do a circle. Um, you give it an origin and you give it a radius. There. Um, you could have loved this. <laughs> you can just draw things, right? Or you just render all, everything. Um, OK, uh, you can do like a rectangle. And the rectangle, you just have, I think the way the rectangle one works is you give it um, a lower corner and you give it an upper corner. 
I think that's the way that one works. Yep, it is. Great, cool. Um, and then also you can pick colors just by straight up typing the color there. Um, and you could specify colors more precisely, something called RGB color. Uh, it doesn't take 255, 255, 255. It does a ratio of them. So just scale all that down and just do each of these numbers from zero to one. It just takes three numbers from zero to one. So um, if I just do one red, zero green, and one blue, that should be purple. Uh, pink? Wow, apparently I don't know how colors work. Um, OK, well, anyway. Uh, oh, no, no, it's magenta, right? Because it's a computer, <laughs> right? So, OK, so uh, I guess if we do green and blue, it should be like cyan, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, you'd call that cyan, right? Okay, anyway, um, so uh, that's how you specify colors. Uh, cool, so let's do like a weird example of manipulate. Um, what if I want to um, make a variable for how red this is, and I'll call it R, I'll uh, manipulate R, I'll start at zero, and manipulate R from zero to one. So now I drag the slider, and it will add more red to the color. Wow, that was useless because it <laughs> turned white. Let me, okay, this should make this more and more magenta. Ta-da, okay. So that just shows how like versatile this manipulate function is. You can manipulate like literally anything. Um, you, don't, you don't even have to do, it doesn't even have to be a number. Um, let, me, let me do another example. Um, oh, sorry, any questions so far about Mathematica? Okay. Uh, is, is this your new favorite thing that you're going to use for uh, all of your uh, physics projects and mathematical musings? <laughs> uh, the, if you guys are interested, oh, oh, oh right. Um, yeah, on my website is also um, just like a portfolio. It's okay, maybe portfolio is like a, it's like a, a big word to use. It's not, I'm not like submitting it to something like an art portfolio. Um, there's a collection of random Mathematica things I've made. Um, some of them are math, some of them are physics, lots of them are physics. Um, there's some, some fractals, uh, there's some astronomy stuff. Um, yeah, so you can check that out if you want like some examples. Uh, all the code is posted on my website also, so you can just like, um, you can just download it or whatever. Um, okay, I'm like tinker with it. Uh, okay, so um, what was I gonna do? Right, I was gonna show you, let me show you um, Wolfram Alpha. Uh, I, I'm sure you guys have heard of Wolfram Alpha, just like you can just go on Wolfram Alpha and type in the calculus question, and I'll give you an answer. Um, Wolfram Alpha is a mathematical product. It's, uh, it's, it's written in Mathematica um, and you can access Wolfram Alpha from Mathematica. Um, what you do is you hold control and hit equals. Uh, I'm using a Mac, by the way. Uh, I think it's the same on a PC, but I'm not certain. So control equals, and it does this. And now here you can type something um, just like it was Wolfram, Wolfram Alpha. So give me the derivative of uh, sine x uh, with respect to x. And then you hit shift enter like usual. And you see that little spinning beach ball because it has to go to the internet. Um, network operation timed out. Oh no. Ah, hold on, let's try again. No? Okay, maybe Mathematica doesn't know WRT. How about uh, <laughs> with respect to X? Derivative of sine X with respect to X. Let's try that. You did type derivative if sine. Oh, thank you. Oh, wow, that's a very important typo. Mathematica does catch typos sometimes, but not gonna catch that typo because if is a logical word. Uh, <laughs> Um, this messed up because I assigned x to a value earlier. So it took the derivative of sine like 2.2 with respect to 2.2, which doesn't mean anything. Um, so, uh, right, so derivative of sine y with respect to y, you see here, it converted it to the Mathematica code. So I could have just typed this, the Mathematica code. D is just the derivative operator in Mathematica. And we get the same exact thing. So um, if what you typed into Wolfram Alpha or into this little box here uh, is something that it knows how to write mathematical code for, it will do it and then it'll do it for you. Um, but what you have access to extra is the, the knowledge database. So Stephen Wolfram has this mission where he wants to democratize, it's an awesome mission. He wants to democratize like human knowledge. He wants everything that humans know he wants every human to be able to access everything that humans know, like just at the tip of their fingers. Like if it's if it's known, you should be able to access it in like a second. Like, you know, whether it's like um, something simple like the elements or something complicated, like, you know, you know, the, the orbital levels of an electron or something or something hard, like doing a, a numerical integral or something. He wants it all just to be at your fingertips. Um, so uh, there's a huge like uh, database of just like stuff. So um, here, let me give you an example. A uh, picture of Bernie. Sanders. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, okay. It's an image object, and here's the image. Great. 
Um, and while, I, while I'm here, let me give you an example of just how, uh, just how much Mathematica doesn't care about types. So I'm gonna say Bernie is a variable. Uh, Bernie is equal to, and then I'll search picture of Bernie Sanders, and then I'll run it. And now we have this Bernie variable is set to this picture and I can multiply Bernie by two if I want. Uh, and apparently multiplying it by two is coded to increase the, the, the hue or whatever. Um, I can see what happens if I raise Bernie to the power of two. Uh, it got darker. Any, any reasonable language would get mad at you for trying to raise a picture to a number, right? Like Python would not stand for this, right? But Mathematica, it doesn't care. It's, it, Mathematica just like really hates throwing error messages at you. So, um, right, okay, great. Uh, I, wonder, I wonder if I could do anything else weirder. There's no way sign of Bernie will do anything. That's gotta be something bad. Wow, it did something. It's, what did it do? Why is the sign operation defined for functions? Okay, I don't know what's going on in their heads other than don't give the user errors. But okay, there, an example of how Mathematica really doesn't care about types. Um, okay, so uh, here, and then let's do, um, right, okay. So I wanna give you an example of something that you can manipulate that's not just a, a slider for a number. Uh, integrate Bernie Sanders. Okay, with respect to what? Give me a, give me a, uh, a, give me a domain. I don't know, you choose. I don't care. I choose. X from negative two to two. Uh, oh, no. Oh, wait, sorry. Oh, wait, no. wait, sorry. sorry, wait. That's not Mathematica. That's me, because I set X equal to something earlier. Remember, I already used that X. Uh, oh, this is a good teaching moment. Um, clear. Clear X. So now X should work. Uh, oh, that's what happens if you integrate Bernie from negative two to two. Wait, hold on. Let's, let's, get, let's get a handle on what's going on here. Um, it's interpreting the image as like a vector of, of the RGB brightness of all the pixels, right? And that's why it, when you square it, everything gets darker because if you square oh. a number from zero to one, uh, it gets smaller, right? That um, sounds pretty good. I like that. Uh, that yeah, it, it very that very well could be it. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, what's a picture? It's um, it's it's just an array of uh, red, green, blue. Uh, uh, you know, three pupils. Um, so this is what happens as we integrate Bernie to a higher and higher number. Uh, so he's like falling into the sun. Okay, well, <laughs> there's like nuked Bernie. Okay, so um, all right, this is ridiculous. This is not math, but <laughs> uh, Mathematica can do a lot more than just math. Um, okay, uh, one of my favorite databases is uh, that has Pokemon. So, um, so here, uh, dummy list. I'm just gonna have dummy list equal to, okay, so list in Mathematica, use squiggly brackets. So I'm gonna have the first one be Bulbasaur uh, and the second one, oh no, okay, this backfired. Um, yeah. It's not backfired, it just did so much more than I expected it to. I, I wanted it to give me a picture of these things, but instead it gave me the objects. So Mathematica, when I say it's not object oriented, I mean, it's not like, like it doesn't use like a backbone of objects, but it does have objects. It actually has everything. It's like, um, it's like Ruby, like it just has everything in it but it's not picky at all. So you can use objects if you want, but you can't like use objects in an intimate way like you can with Java because it doesn't like give you access to these base things. It wants to, it's it really is trying its best to like a super high level, like top level language. Like it gives you these really big things to work with and you don't have to worry about the nuts and bolts of it. Um, it's like black boxes for everything. Um, so anyway, when I looked up Bulbasaur, it gave me the Bulbasaur Pokemon object um, because there's multiple attributes that Mathematica has already logged as attributes of Pokemon. So like this, I don't even know what to ask for. Um, I don't even know what to ask for. Number of dummy list one. Is that the right thing to ask? Like give me the number of that Pokemon. I don't know if that's gonna work. Weight of it, give me the, here, me, okay, hold on. Give me the, here, give me the um, special attack of Bulbasaur. <laughs> Ah, it's just another object, fun. And then evaluate it as a number. There it is, there's the number. Okay, so there's Mathematica logging the special attack of Bulbasaur for some reason. Um, okay, so uh, let me make my dummy list more specific. Um, dummy list uh, is going to be equal to uh, picture of Bulbasaur. Uh, and then Oh, we're not going to multiply these pictures. That would be bad. Uh, picture, not that bad as we've seen, but, but now I'm trying to do. Okay, picture of Charmander. 
Okay, and here's our dummy list. Great, it's a list. See these curly brackets, one, there's bubble star, there's Charmander. And now I'm going to manipulate, manipulate, uh, manipulate, um, and then I'm just gonna dummy list. And the way you index or uh, reach into lists is double brackets here. Um, Mathematical index is at one because it's made by mathematicians, not computer scientists. Um, so you can love that or hate that, but it starts at one. If you type zero into the list, it'll return the entire list. Okay, so um, dummy list, I'm just gonna do K and then we'll manipulate K. Uh, so if I manipulate K from one to two, I just type it like this, like I usually do. It does give me a slider. Um, and most of the values of the slider don't make any sense because you can't ask for the 1.304th index of a list. It has to be an integer. So how can I force this to be, uh, you just have to look at the syntax or look at my notes for a bold. Okay, I wouldn't study the syntax of the different manipulate options. I would check out my Mathematica notes for a whole bunch of examples of how to get the different kinds of manipulate things. So for example, if you want a drop down list, you just make a, you just make a, uh, you, you type it like this, <laughs> right? And then it gives you, uh, it gives you two little options. Um, and it automatically will, uh, so let me add some things to my dummy list. Um, seven, uh, we can add a function to our list. Oh yeah, the lists aren't typed either. The lists can have different kinds of objects in them because Mathematica doesn't care about objects. Um, Apple, okay. Oh, is that Bernie? Okay, cool. Um, so, and now let's do one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, uh, great. And there's enough here to decide to give the drop down list instead, so. What a weird list. Okay, uh, great, cool. So manipulate uh, can do lots of different things. You can do like these boxes, you can drop down lists, you can do sliders, and you can also do locators like this. Then move around. Cool, um, great. Uh, I told you how plot works. I told you how graphics works. I told you what dynamic module is. Um, maybe that's most of what you need to like use this code. I have a whole bunch of examples here. Um, I, this is kind of like <laughs> this is kind of like um, how I made the notes. Uh, like these are literally just this is like literally just like I just screenshot this and put it in the notes. Um, so um, yeah, this is that optical Doppler effect thing. So um, right, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's seven forty-two, and uh, we still have people hanging out. Um, is there something you want to see in Mathematica? Um, or I can talk about the optical Doppler effect, or I could show you just non-special relativity, just like crazy things you can do in Mathematica to give you an idea. Um, could you talk about the Doppler effect a bit? Sure. Um, okay, Aaron, thanks for uh, sticking around so long. Yep, I'll, uh, hopefully I'll see you in a couple weeks. Um, yeah, so optical Doppler effect, yeah. So, um, right. Uh, particle, so any particle that you can see is like continuously emitting light. Like physicists will say, oh, it's a, a, a thing like uh, 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 all these causality lines. It could be like gravitational waves or, um, or like, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, like gluons, uh, which are the the um, transfer particle for the strong nuclear force. Um, so anyway, um, these causality lines don't have to be light, um, but okay. So you have a normal particle that's flying through space here at a certain velocity. Um, and then uh, it's emitting information is the way to think about it. It's, it's, some of the information is gravity. Some of the information is, is light. Okay, it's emitting information at the speed of causality continuously. Um, and you're continuously as the stationary observer uh, receiving that information so you can interpret, you know, what's going on with that particle. Um, okay, so I picked a segment here along the normal particles like lifetime, like so it's just like from this point to this point, like there's a segment. And then the, the shaded region is to go a whole bunch of stacked causality lines. It's like, you know, it's like causality, um, like uh, uh, quadrilateral, if you want. Um, it's uh, so then. Uh, we just follow the causality lines from uh, each point uh, along this along the journey within this little segment, and we follow it up. And what we see is that when it hits uh, the observer's world line, this length is longer than this length. The um the so it so over this period of like time or space, however you want to think about it, um the particle kept emitting information. That information, as you follow these causality lines, um got squished here. And all we're using here is that there's a speed of causality. Um, I, I, one more thing about speed of causality. I'm going to talk about this a lot next lesson. But while we're on it, um, so let's think about this. Like, what is cause and effect? It's um, it's you know, this event happens and that causes another event to happen. 
um, if you zoom in on anything, it's just going to be these kind of like causality speed things happening. If you zoom in on like Newton's cradle, um, is it really like these big metal balls hitting each other? Well, no, if you zoom in far enough, it's like, um, it's like photons jumping between energy levels of atoms. So all of a sudden we're talking about photons again. It's really just all about uh, speed of causality things. Um, so the, um, right, so that's, that's really how all information propagates is at the speed of causality. Uh, and then, you know, Newton thought that this kind of like um, effect of gravity communicates instantly, like so over, in, over any arbitrary amounts of space, it can just like travel instantly. The moon disappears right now, the tides fall right now. Um, but the, uh, let's think about that. So uh, if everything is really bound by the speed of causality at the smallest level, there's only two options. Either the speed of causality is infinite or it's finite. But if it really was infinite and everything's just a series of little causal things happening, then wouldn't all of reality just like happen all at once? Like all of the all of the causes the causes and effects would just like collapse down, and reality would be one instant. Okay, reality is not one instant. I think therefore I am. I exist. Okay, cool. Um, therefore, causality must be the speed of causality must be finite. And if it's finite, we may as well call it one because it's fundamental enough that I may I should base my units off of it, not the other way around. Um, Okay, great. So there's a justification for why speed of causality exists and why it's one. <laughs> okay, so um, right. So all you're using here is that information travels by the speed of causality, uh, and the stuff here, the information here, got collapsed down to here. Um, and this collapsing is the Doppler effect. So frequency is relative. So you have a wave, but its frequency is just like how many, you know, how many wavelengths happen per second or whatever. That's relative because if the object's moving towards you or away from you, you'll measure what the frequency is differently. Like there's no objective frequency, it's a perception thing. So um, this, as this object, this particle is moving towards you, all of its information gets compressed down. It's actually more fun, what I'm showing you here is actually way deeper than just like an optical Doppler effect. This is blue shifting, like it looks like a higher energy particle because the wavelength's shortened. Um, but it's, it's, I'm saying way more than that. I'm not just saying that light does this, I'm saying causality does this. So an object, if an object is moving towards you, there's a causal Doppler effect where like, the, the information coming off of it compresses down as it comes towards you. Um, and like a causal Doppler effect is actually like, a, like uh, an illuminating way, part of my pun, to think about, um, to think about uh, a lot of the weird special relativity effects that we're gonna encounter. So keep that on the, on the brain. Um, but okay, so see, when the particle is going away from you, we take a segment, this length of segment is the same as this length. Um, and when we follow the causality lines backwards, it's forwards in time, but it's backwards in space. But what's backwards in space? It's to the left. Okay, whatever. Um, and then it hits the observer. We see that now it's stretched out. So when a particle is moving away from you, the information that comes off of it, um, or when a thing is moving away from you, the information that comes off of it is stretched out by your perception. So uh, causality gets stretched out. Um, and in the ex example of light, that means it's a red shifting because the wavelength appears to stretch out. Um, so this is why everything that's moving away from us appears like red shifted. And what we really mean by that is the astronomers saw lower wavelength things coming than they were expecting. And when it's coming towards you, it's it's uh, blue shifted. They should probably call it violet shifted. But anyway, um, yeah, so it's like higher frequency. But uh, yeah, so this is the uh, causal Doppler effect. And as an example, the optical Doppler effect, or as an example, the gravitational Doppler effect, an object emitting gravitational waves, like, a, like you know, something spinning. Um, with mountains on it, um, flying towards you, uh, you would you would get a you would get a gravitational wave Doppler effect. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, so for the three people uh, still here, uh, wow, I'm I'm uh, flattered that I've uh, captured your attention this long. Uh, but let's call it for this lesson, and I'll let you uh, ruminate on that. Um, read you can read through the notes if you want because uh, there's some subtleties in there that um that i didn't have time to go over um there's also just some me philosophizing in there if you're interested in that uh, and then um and then i'll post this mathematical code tonight so you can play around with it and stuff uh and then two weeks from now we'll talk about causality and in uh, a system where so many things are relative positions relative times relative velocities relative uh um, apparently frequency is relative, all these things are relative. Um, how do we actually say anything about anything? We'll, we'll talk about like how you can actually say concrete things. Like what is not relative? What's objective? If it's not time and it's not space and it's not velocity and it's not energy or any of that. Like what, what, what's concrete? Okay, that'll be, that'll be the, the mission statement of next time. Okay, cool. Well, uh, thank you so much, Ajit. Uh, and we'll look forward to hearing the rest of your insight uh, in two weeks from now on Thursday the 25th. Um, for the attendees here, uh, this will be posted on our YouTube channel, which I will link right here.
Um, so if you'd like to refer back to the recording, uh, you, can, uh, you can go to that link. Um, and also we will link uh, in the description of that, all of the uh, notes that uh, Ajit uh, was showing on the screen, uh, as well as his contact information. So uh, thank you all so much for joining us uh, and we'll see you back in two weeks from now. Okay, see you guys. Thanks, guys.